Welcome Horizon community, thank you for joining us. I am Rob Viglione and we have Alberto Garofolo joining. Thank you Rob. So what we want to do today is, well first of all we're, we're coming to you live from Milan, Italy and what we want to do is talk a little bit about 51% attacks and first of all explain what happened to us uh, earlier in June and we'll go into some detail there and then we're going to talk about the mechanisms behind 51% attacks in general and then we're going to talk about the cool stuff about the mitigating mechanisms that uh, we've figured out how to uh, make such attacks much more costly in the future and hence they should be much less likely. So what happened to us back in June was essentially we had um, an unfortunate event which was a 51% attack as they call it in, in the industry which is essentially where uh, a majority of hash rate on our network was commandeered by a malicious miner. We'll call this malicious miner, say, uh, M for Maurizio. And uh, what Maurizio was able to do was essentially, he was able to mine a sequence of blocks in private uh, in which he injected a double spend, uh, so reverting uh, an original transaction that he had previously done on the network, and essentially commit uh, a modern day crypto heist, um, so a, a theft. Now some big things that you know, we, we learned that the community was concerned about immediately was uh, no private keys were actually stolen in this type of attack. 51% attacks do not attack or decrypt or steal private keys. They do not you know, decrypt or steal your messages. So no information of yours specifically on the blockchain was ever at risk. Really what happened was some entity in the community um, that was accepting Zen as a form of payment was essentially conned into thinking that a payment that uh, they received was actually valid truth when the, the malicious miner Maurizio was able to inject a sequence of other blocks into the chain after the fact that invalidated that truth. So what we did at the day or the night of the attack, and this happened at, I don't know, about 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday, um, East Coast time in the US was we spun up our team. So we knew that this was a threat for a period of time, a few weeks beforehand. There was actually a paper that came out in, in the industry that showed the cost of mounting these types of attacks for different projects out there. And we knew that this was a threat at the time. So we, we actually put together mitigation plans. We put in a tripwire. We prepped our teams to understand what they have to do in the event of such an attack. And when it happened to us, we sprung into action and we handled it, I think, quite professionally. Um, so we had every division of the organization spin up. We had our engineering team, our infrastructure team, we had operations team, our business development team, our marketing team, and so forth. Actually following the events, documenting the, the events perfectly, understanding them. We had legal support. We reached out to law enforcement. And basically the full package of what you would expect from a professional organization. We put together at the night of the attack and the very next morning, we released all of this information to the market and we informed our community and all of our stakeholders of exactly what happened and what this means for them. And then the very next day we had Alberto and a team start working on a more enduring solution, uh, something that actually modifies the engineering consensus for the protocol in such a way that trying to mount this kind of attack in the future will be much more costly. And we'll actually walk you through some of the mathematics of how costly right now our initial implementation of this what we call a penalty mechanism um, will impose on potentially malicious miners. And then we'll, we'll talk about the sequence of how this stuff happens. So Alberto, would you please um, you know, begin describing sure. some of the, the mechanisms here? Thank you, Rob. Uh, okay, let's describe how this kind of attack works. Mm -hmm. Assume that I want to send some coins to you mm -hmm. and I create a transaction that is included in block, let us say, 100. After such block, other blocks are mined and the network continues mining these blocks. <coughs> let us say that uh, you consider a transaction final after 10 blocks. It's your decision. Yeah, okay? seems reasonable. Seems, seems reasonable. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, miners keep mining and we arrive at block 110 mm -hmm. and you give me the goods or whatever because you consider it final. Right. In the meanwhile, uh, a malicious miner, the one that sent the transaction, 
privately mined another chain in parallel with uh, a transaction that reverts your the transaction uh, giving the money to you, okay? And he privately mined 11 blocks. Right, so one more than, one more. than the original chain. Exactly. And after having mined 100 blocks, it revealed this private, private chain mm -hmm. to the network and broadcast yeah. it. So what happened? All the miners and all the nodes will consider this new uh, blockchain as the active one because it's longer right, than the previous one. Yep. And so also the miners are going to start mining this new chain. Right. So this is the new truth of the network then. They, yes. they discard the original truth of the network. Yeah. They reverted, he reverted uh, the truth. Yes. Okay. So what happens? that the transaction that you consider final is not uh, more valid. And so uh, you have not anymore the coins, yep. but they have the goods. Exactly. Okay. And this is, let me say, uh, based on your initial assumption of 10 blocks of confirmation. Right. Okay. To, to consider it as final. Okay. So uh, after this event, we started thinking about uh, to find a solution mm -hmm. uh, to prevent such kind of behavior. I mean, this is uh, how uh, proof of work, uh, Bitcoin based uh, uh, cryptocurrency work. Right. The, the only thing that matters in the longest chain rule is that you have, in fact, the longest chain. Yes. So <laughs> it's, exactly. it's a sort of naive consensus that has worked quite well for the last 10 years. Yeah. But now we know that the economics or the dynamics of the mining marketplace has changed. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it's, it can be profitable to, 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 to make such kind of uh, attack. Well, obviously, depending on the number of confirmation blocks you consider, okay? Right. But obviously, uh, um, we have to say one other thing that uh, user want to have a low confirmation time. So, I mean, of transaction course. can yeah. can can be considered final uh, earlier. Yeah. Than well, this is always the balancing act. So, for real world users in a real world economy, you want to have as small of a confirmation you know time essentially as possible because you want to do real things. Yes. Right. You want to uh, transact with other human beings and do things in an economically efficient way. So, of course, even with the the naive longest chain rule, this is still perfectly fine. Yeah. If say Alice or some user were to just say, mm, we're going to wait a thousand blocks yeah. for reality you know, before they accept this transaction is irreversible. It's just that in this, the reality of trying to balance usability with security, you know, I think the, um, the previous decisions we realize now were insufficient given this simple longest chain rule system. So that's where we need to now talk about modifying the, the Nakamoto consensus. Yeah, exactly. And so what is the common factor of these kind of attacks is that you private, privately mine your, uh, your chain and broadcast, delay, broadcast it delayed. So right. uh, all the blocks, uh, I mean from 100 to 110, are <laughs> broadcasted, uh, broadcasted after a delay. Yeah. Okay. And this is the, uh, this make the, the, the attack feasible. Right. Okay, so we want to penalize this kind of behavior in a way that uh, consider situation where for network latencies and, uh, and other uh, possible problems, I mean, mm -hmm. blocks are uh, going to be delivered delayed. But in situation like this one, uh, prevent uh, miners to start considering this truth uh, at the moment they receive this new truth. Right. Yeah. So maybe Alberto, you can maybe explain to, to the viewers how the penalty system works. Yes. So what is the innovation here? Oh, uh, the problem here is to not consider the active chain a uh, chain that is submitted delayed. So let's say that we are applying a penalty mm -hmm. to each of the delayed block right. that is related to the delay. Yes. 
Okay, so essentially though, we could say that for the public chain, the, the network believes that block 110 is the yeah. tip of the chain. Correct. So by delay, what do we mean exactly? Okay. Let's suppose that miner, the malicious miner, submit block 100, a parallel block 100, yes. while the rest of the network consider uh, the tip of the chain at 110, okay? The Got honest it. chain, okay? So we apply a penalty to this block, right. that is 110 minus 100, because the height of this block is 100, okay? Right. And for this one, 110 minus 101, okay? And so on for all the blocks. Right, okay. So it's additive then. Yeah, so that's additive. How, yeah. That's how we get this quadratic function, which is essentially the, the solution to a sequence that goes from the summation of the first number to, say, n. You know, it, it's valid for you know, any arbitrary number of blocks that are submitted delayed. We sum that up and we get the, the solution to this is n times n plus 1 over 2. Correct. So an example here would be, say, a 5 block delay. Now, of course, we put in here a minimum where we don't even yeah. start counting a penalty yeah. because we know that there's natural network latencies. Correct. So we know that even an honest miner may have a 1 or 2 second latency by submitting from somewhere in the world, and that's okay. So we don't want to penalize honest miners. What we want to do is we have a minimum threshold at which then we start applying a penalty, which if we just gave a simple example of, say, a five block delay. Yeah, just do not, I mean, uh, yeah. uh, uh, for five blocks, no penalty will be applied, but for a, just yeah. for an example, it, yeah. it's, uh, uh, it can work. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for example, if a uh, um, uh, um, malicious miner submit five block delay, mm -hmm. uh, it will get penalty such malicious chain of five multiplied six divided by two. Okay. Right. Yeah. And okay, but let let's explain what is this penalty because yes. it's not so clear. Yes, probably. exactly. Okay. The penalty is something that until is not resolved, mm -hmm. honest miner are not going to consider such chain as eligible. Right. Okay. Right. In this way, what happened in 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 this case? where the malicious miner submitted all the delayed blocks, mm -hmm. the honest miner are going to continue mining the right. previous chain, right. okay? Okay, but as you told before, we want to uh, consider also situation where uh, there can be some latency and so on. Yes. So. And, and we do not want to create a persistent fork. Exactly. Okay. We, we don't want a partition of the network that just cannot go away. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what we do is to decrease the penalty mm -hmm. of the malicious, of the, the parallel chain, okay, right. until uh, for um, one unit per block that is submitted uh, right. uh, in, in the right order, let's right. say, not delayed. Right. Okay, so yeah. once we receive the, the uh, 111, yeah. we will, uh, once the 110 is, uh, is yeah. published, we will decrease by one, right. okay? Yeah. And, and so on. Right. Okay. So essentially though, the network participants will see two chains here. They'll see one chain, which was truly the valid chain. It'll have a penalty of say zero, right? So penalty here equals zero for yeah, correct. this one. Penalty here, given the five block delay, we would have a penalty, you know, prime equals uh, 15 is what we calculated, right? Five times four times three times two times one yeah. um, divided by two, right? Yeah, and that's right. gonna be a penalty of 15. And what you're saying is uh, the network would see these two things and honest miners would mine the one with no penalty yeah. and they would ignore this one. So if the malicious miner wants to force his chain to be the valid truth of the network, he would have to continue mining on this one publicly, yeah. in which case he's competing with the entire global network of miners. Correct. And for every block that he mines ahead of the other chain, there's a decrement of one to this penalty score. Right. So this penalty score would have to converge to zero in order for the network to consider this valid truth. Yeah, and this is for five blocks. Consider yeah. what is for 10 blocks. Yes. 10 blocks will be 
10 multiplied for uh, 11 divided by 2. Yep. So this is yeah. a lot. Exactly. So yeah. he, had, he has to mine uh, a lot of blocks yep. publicly and it will cost a lot. Right. And let's remember that uh, a 51% attack is essentially a stochastic event. So the miner, the malicious miner, is really rolling the dice. It's like a casino. They're investing a whole bunch of real resources and money right now to try to hijack a network. And there's some large probability that they're going to fail. Yeah. So when, when it makes economic sense to even attempt to do this kind of thing is when you know that you have a reasonable chance of success in a, a sort of narrow window. We impose penalties that are this large, the probability of success within any reasonable window collapses. Correct. And moreover, during some such penalty period, also user can do things to prevent, right. for example, I mean, uh, to not send the goods or, or doing other uh, actions that uh, uh, will prevent the, the right. malicious user uh, to get the profit. Yeah. So that's a great point. And one example here of users being able to take action would be an exchange. And if an exchange yeah. were to see that there's a penalty on this you know, parallel chain right here, they, would, they could refuse to release their deposit funds. Yeah. So this is one very clear way where in the real world, users could actually take mitigating actions that are very clearly uh, preventative. They can yeah. prevent this type of attack. Yeah, so, so two kind of, of things we introduce. First, it will cost a lot of more, a lot more to perform an attack. Yeah. And second, uh, in the meanwhile, the user, the exchange, can take some action yeah. to, to, let me say, uh, to prevent the, 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 the steal. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And you had another innovation with that parameter that you were adding to the code as well, where now users could actually query to see what a, kind of a, a safe uh, minimum number of confirmations. Yeah, uh, that's like. another uh, yeah. that's another important point because uh, we can uh, tell to the user how many real confirmation blocks right. have been have been passed from right. his transaction. So. Just to, to make an example, if the user uh, okay, sees this transaction yeah. and here asks for how many confirmation blocks uh, are passed from uh, the transaction, okay, in the previous version they were 10. Right. Now they are 10 multiplied by 11 divided by 2 because right. if you want to revert this transaction right. you have to mine all these blocks right yeah exactly which i think is a huge difference now for security of the network yeah now oh, this is great you guys thank you for joining us here uh, as we we work out some of the details expect more more such innovations as we go forward because we really are rethinking the entire system and rethinking Everything that I, I think we often take for granted in the industry of how um, this type of technology works. And if we keep our, our values, our vision, and our mission in mind, we'll be able to tailor the technology in the most elegant way that solves problems at lowest cost.